So it's a pleasure to welcome you back to the study of Daniel and the Revelation. I'm Dr. Jim Said. My wife Rhonda is working this process with me, and we've been in deep study of this work for years, and it's our pleasure to bring this forward. So I'd like to begin this study if you join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word. We tread sacred ground when we open your word, so we ask your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. The Spirit of truth, may you show us things to come. And Lord, may we understand the significance of these events that you unfold before us as it really also to this very end of time. We ask you to open our minds and our hearts to receive the truths you'd have us understand for now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And for those of you who were not here last uh, session, you really should go and start at the beginning. This is session number two. And so you, you want to follow it sequentially through this series, and it will start to become very simple and very clear, even though we're in probably the heaviest part of the whole study right here. But. It's one of the more obtuse sections of Daniel 11. So we've been studying the progression of six Syrian wars in the realm of Grecia. So we saw that Greece emerged with Alexander the Great when he conquered the Persians in 331 BC. He died an early death. He was 32 years old and there was vying for control of all of Grecia, the empire he, con he conquered, all the way from Egypt to India. Out of the many that were vying for control, two emerged. Seleucus dynasty of the north of Babylonia and the Ptolemaic dynasty to the south of Egypt. They then vied for control over each other through a series of wars called the Six Syrian Wars. And I think that we did point out in the first session the significance of those six wars is that it's what led to the point of both Egypt and Babylon giving their power over to Rome. And then Rome ruled the world. So they literally gave their power to Rome. And we're going to find in the book of Revelation that there is a nation that gives their power to Rome also in the end of time. So we want to watch carefully these details because history is repeated. The book of Revelation, uh, Dr. Said pointed out, brings forth the future out of the history of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel unlocks the book of Revelation. It's a, quite an amazing study, so we welcome you to stay with us and follow through until you get this foundation and then the book of Revelation will come alive. Amen. So we're going to pick up where we left off with the third Syrian war and you're welcome as Ron mentioned to just review the previous lecture to bring you up to speed to where we are now. So sweetheart would you please read verses 7 through 9 of Daniel chapter 11. All right. But out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Keep going. Amen. Um, verse 9. So the king of the south shall come unto his kingdom and shall return unto his own land. Thank you. So these three verses describe what is called the third Syrian war between the Ptolemies of Egypt and the Seleucids of the north of Babylonia. Could so you, let's take it one segment at a time from a historical perspective. Could you Make just read through it and put in what they are? Exactly. Okay. But out of a branch of her roots now this is referring to Berenice II, who was murdered by the put-away wife of Antiochus II, Laodice, and she wanted to ensure that her son was going to become the next emperor of Grecia in Babylonia. And so she had her husband killed, she had the son of Berenice killed, she had Berenice killed and her ladies-in-waiting killed, and Berenice II had called her brother to come and assist her 
to have her son take the take charge of the rule of of the Babylonian Empire. So out of out of a branch of her roots, that is of Berenice II's siblings, that is Ptolemy the third now, who follows Ptolemy the second, who died in 246 BC, shall stand up one in his estate. So Ptolemy the second arose in power, Ptolemy the third arose in power in 246 when his father dies, and shall come up with an army, shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, shall deal against them, and shall prevail. Now here's what happens. So to avenge his sister Berenice II's death, or murder, Ptolemy III raises an immense army and invades the territory of the Seleucid king Seleucus II, who is the son of Laodice. Okay, can you say it with king of the north, king of the south? Happily. So the king of the south is avenging his sister's death. He comes against the king of the north. And so he raises an army from the south, comes against the north. Now, the northern king is the son of Laodice, who has Berenice and Antiochus II killed, and the ladies-in-waiting killed. So Seleucid II is invaded by Ptolemy III of the south. So the north is invaded by the south. Now, Seleucid II controls Syria, or reigns in Syria, along with his mother, Laodice I, who was the, the murderess, and then Ptolemy III emerges the conqueror over Syria and that part of Asia. Now, verse 8 says, And shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold. Now, here's what happened historically. Ptolemy III of the south conquers the north, returns to Egypt, back to the south, to quell sedition in Egypt. That's what brings him back so quickly. But he plunders the kingdom of the north of Seleucus II. So he takes 40,000 talents of silver and precious vessels, 2,500 images of the gods, among which were those formerly taken by Cambyses of Persia. As a result of the return of these images, the idolatrous Egyptians bestow upon Ptolemy the title of Oyergetes, which means benefactor, for having restored their captive gods. So that's what it said. So he's taking the gods back. Exactly. So it says in verse 8, He shall carry captives into Egypt their gods with their princes and their precious vessels of silver and of gold. So he takes his booty from the north and brings it back to the south. Then it says, And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Now I love that statement because it makes clear who we're talking about. So Ptolemy II of the south rules from 246 to 221 B.C. But Seleucus II rules the north, dies earlier, he rules from 246 to 225. So, he, so the king of the north rules four years less than the king of the south. So it, it clarifies that particular segment, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Then it says, so the king of the south, which is Ptolemy III, shall come into his, Seleucus so II's kingdom, the northern kingdom, shall return into his own land. So he comes back into Egypt after conquering the north. Why do you suppose God gave so much detail about these, these six Syrian wars? That's a great question. I asked myself that a lot as I studied the details of this, and it dawned on me that we're seeing a contrast between God's character and God's government versus man's character and man's government. God's government and character leads only to eternal joy, eternal happiness, eternal life. Man's way leads to destruction and degradation and death. It can do nothing but. Greed and fighting, killing. Exactly. So man is sinful, <clears throat> and the wages of sin are death. death, eternal death, contrasted with eternal life in Christ. So we're seeing this attempt of man's way following Satan's selfish ways or prideful ways leading only to what can come from that is destruction. It will always come to its rightful end. And there will only be suffering as a result. Look at what's happening today. Sin is being allowed to ripen to its full state of what I call compost. Putting it gently. And the Lord had to allow Satan's allegation 
or a proclamation to run its full course, that his way of governance was better than God's, that the angels were satisfactory to govern themselves more than God was able to govern them. So the Lord had to give Satan his full um, capacity to demonstrate his allegation. We're seeing the consequence of that today. As I tell my patients, I disagree with death, with degradation and disease. I think they're bad ideas. <laughs> what was Lucifer thinking in heaven? So, here we see what's happening in this third Syrian war, also called the Laodicean War, by the way, uh, because of Laodice being an instigator to this. And we see it began when Berenice asked her brother Ptolemy III, the new king, to come to Antioch to help place her son on the throne. By the time he gets there, his sister and her child are both assassinated. So this is a war of revenge, man's way. There was no forgiveness, it was revenge. So he declares war, Ptolemy III declares war on the north, and the newly crowned son, Seleucus II, and we see where it ends. Ptolemy is victorious, he gains more territory, and the south loses. I said the south wins over the north. So we see these two arrows. The south avenges his sister's death and assassination. He attacks and regains lost territory and sea power and booty from the north. The north loses that territory, concedes sea power, and loses its reserves of gold and silver. That's the third Syrian war. Now, does it end there? No, sadly. Man keeps trying and if not him, the next generation. And what do we see happening in the world today? Next generations forgetting what was happened before and start again this power control or power struggle. So let's read the next three verses, please, 10, 11, and 12. Okay, we're in Daniel 11, verse 10. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude <clears throat> of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through then shall he return, and he be stirred up even to his fortress. We're going to need some help with that one, Dr. Jim. Mm -hmm. And the king of the south shall be moved with chloror, that's anger, and, with, and shall come forth to, and fight with him, even the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. Amen. So now we're going to see the fourth Syrian war emerge. Okay. So we'll start out with the first two words, but his. Now this his refers to Seleucus II, the one who was defeated by um, Ptolemy III. So this is now Seleucus of the north. His sons are Seleucus III and Antiochus III, also called Antiochus the Great or Antiochus Magnus. His sons shall be stirred up. Now they're stirred up with a zeal to vindicate and avenge the cause of their father and their country's, um, their country's loss against Egypt. So Egypt is victorious in the, in the Third Syrian War. Now what happens? The north that was defeated wants to come back and defeat the south. So Babylon wants to defeat Egypt. Babylon wants to take over Egypt, exactly. And shall assemble a multitude of great forces. Now, Seleucus III, this first son, assembles a huge army when he took the throne in 225 BC. But it says, and one, Antiochus III, Magnus, or Antiochus the Great, was the more able leader of the two brothers and was proclaimed king um, two years later in 223 BC. So here's this army that's assembled by Seleucus III, but the other brother, Antiochus III, the, the Great, assumes the role of king because he's a more able leader. And shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Now, Antiochus III leads his army and retakes Seleucia and recovers Syria over two years, 219 to 218. So he uses his army to retake some of the lost territory that the south, Egypt, had taken over earlier in the Third Syrian War. And it says, and be stirred up even to his fortress. Now, Antiochus III overcomes the Egyptian general Nicolaus in battle with thoughts of furthering invading Egypt. So he's on the, on the doorstep now of Egypt. So even to his fortress of the south. Now verse 11. 
and the king of the south. Now this is now Ptolemy IV. Ptolemy IV turns out to be a very able leader, as we'll see, of the south, of Egypt. Shall be moved with choler, with anger, rage. So he sees Antiochus III coming against him, so he's going to say, no, you cannot overcome us. So he says, and shall come forth and fight. This is the Battle of Raphia, which was fought on June 22, 217 B.C. That's the date of that battle. And with him, Antiochus III, that's who he comes and fights with him, with Antiochus III, even with the king of the north of the Seleucid dynasty. So it clarifies who he's coming against. So here you have a north-south battle again. You have Ptolemy IV of the south defending himself against this attack by Antiochus III of the north and comes back against him. And then it says, And he, Antiochus III, shall set forth a great multitude. Now, Antiochus III has 62,000 infantry. This is his army he comes against the south with. 6,000 cavalry, 102 elephants, compared to Ptolemy's, Ptolemy IV, who had 70,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and 73 war elephants. But the multitude is given into his hand, into Ptolemy IV's hand. That's who this is about, the king of the south. So Ptolemy IV is victorious. So we see that Antiochus III, his forces suffer a little under 10,000 foot dead. As history, 300 horses and five elements and 4,000 men were taken prisoner. Ptolemy IV loses 1,500 footmen, soldiers, 700 horses and 16 elephants. Most of the Syrian elephants were taken by the Ptolemies. So you see this battle being fought between the north and south. The south is victorious. Then we come to verse 12, which further talks about the king of the south. And when he, Ptolemy IV, had taken away the multitude of 4,000 prisoners from Antiochus III of the north, he's, again the south is victorious, his, Ptolemy IV's heart shall be lifted up. Now, here's what actually happened in history. Ptolemy IV is a proud pagan king. Of Egypt. Of Egypt. He attempts to force his worship system on the Jews in Jerusalem. Oh, is this when 60,000 Jews were killed? Let's see what happens. Oh, my. He tries to force his worship system on the Jews. So in Jerusalem, he wants to offer up sacrifices to his pagan gods following his pagan system and insists that he even enter the most holy place to find some Jewish law and religion. So he's asserting power right now over the Jews. The most holy place of the sanctuary yes. that was on the earth, the Amen. temple. The temple in Jerusalem mm -hmm. that was rebuilt mm -hmm. and was this worship system pointing to Christ as our Savior. So he wanted to take his pagan gods and put them into God's temple? Amen. And this mm. pagan system do we of sacrifice. See, do we see pagan, um, actually, the ways of the world, the music of the world, the dance of the world, the hype of the world, do we see that coming into the temple of God and his churches and into our hearts, the temple of our hearts today? Sadly. Yes. We do, even in the yeah. church, yeah. which was the Lord created to be his people, to be set apart from the world. Holy and sacred, yes. Yet the world has entered into the church. The influence of the world. Yeah. Amen. So here we see Ptolemy IV attempting to enter his system of worship into the church of ancient Israel. Hmm. Now here's what happens. We know with great difficulty Ptolemy IV was restrained from entering the most holy place. So he leaves just enraged against the Jewish nation. So what does he do? He retaliates <clears throat> with relentless persecution against the Jews. So Ptolemy IV exhibits the mark of the leopard beast, we call it, of Grisha, to force worship, a false worship system, against God's people. So you worship his way or be killed. This is a theme even at this time. And this was happening by the king of the south. Yes. And then when it, the king of the south, in the end here, gives their power over to Rome, it happens again. As we will see. And it will happen in the end, as we see in the book of Revelation. Correct. Interesting. And it will be intensely convoluted at this time, as we'll yeah. see when we yes. come to that. Hmm. So then it says, And he, Ptolemy the fourth, again the king of the south, <clears throat> excuse me, shall cast down many ten thousands. Now, it's estimated between 40,000 and 60,000 Jews were slain during the Ptolemy's persecution, Ptolemy the fourth's persecution. It was a massacre. But he, Ptolemy IV, shall not be strengthened by it. So as the Jewish persecution combined 
the Egyptian revolt weakened the nation. Yeah. He was but, not strengthened by his persecution yeah. against the Jews or right. the Egyptian revolt against so him. So that massacre of the people who were <clears throat> claiming the name of God, that happened again, the Bartholomew massacre. Do you know the year of that? And then it happens in the end of time also. It happened during the Dark Ages. Um, we see that pattern repeated. You know, in the, in Jesus said that in the end, whoever proclaims the name of the Lord will suffer persecution. So exactly. I'm wondering, you know, in the end in Revelation, it says whoever would not receive the mark of the beast would be killed. So we want to stay with the series even though this is a pretty heavy, dark part of it, so you can see the patterns of these things that happen in history. Um, in Ecclesiastes 1, it says, What has been will be, and there is no new thing under the sun. If anyone says to you, see, this is new, that's what you're supposed to tell them. What has been will be. History is repeated, and there is nothing new. It's the same, Satan has his same old pattern, the same repeated repetition that he... Um, uses his little tricks and his little evil schemes. And so we want to watch those these patterns because of what we're going to learn in the book of Revelation, of those patterns being repeated. And we see the Bartholomew massacre happening in 1572. Uh, 1572, so much, much later. later. Um, and we'll see that history coming up in the third section of the North-South Kings. Mm -hmm. So let's go further here. I want to go to the Fifth Syrian War, where we see in this slide the Fourth Syrian War dynamic, where the northern of Antiochus III attacks and regains some of his lost territory, but he's de defeated at the Battle of Ipsus, it's called, and the southern king, Ptolemy IV, resists his, his Antiochus III's attack, but now turns his anger, his rage, against the Jews when he's trying to force his system of worship on the Jews. Right. So for the listeners that didn't see the first series, or the first of this series, um, the X means that the battle was resisted, and when they see a blue X. And mm -hmm. then we have a handout sheets if you want to contact us, you can reach us through to info at the uh, opendoorranchministries.com and we can send you some printouts of these wars if you would like to have them. Amen. That brings us to the Fifth Syrian War. Now this is where we start seeing a transition to Rome. And this gets very interesting to see how this comes about and what will happen at the end of time. So Daniel chapter 11 verses 13 to 15. Huh, sweetheart, if you be so kind to read. For the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. Okay, now this begins a segment of the last two Syrian wars, the fifth and sixth. So let's make sense out of who's being discussed here. So for the king of the north, this is still Antiochus III, shall return to Egypt. He was defeated, but now he's going to come back again. He shall set forth a multitude greater than the former. So he amasses even greater wealth and forces from his eastern expeditions that he had in this transition. He shall certainly come after certain years. So he comes in 199 BC mm. with a great army with much riches. So he now is going to attack the Ptolemaic province in Cyrilus, Syria, and Phoenicia. By 199, he had possession of all that before what's called the Aetolian leader Scopus recovered it for Ptolemy V. Now Ptolemy V is the son of Ptolemy IV. Ptolemy IV dies, his wife dies, and they leave a child. Five years old is now the heir to the south. So Ptolemy V is a boy king. For Egypt. For Egypt. He's five years old. So he obviously is in no position to rule the entire country. So we'll see what happens. So Ptolemy V um, has a general, the Aetolian leader Scopus, Conquer Antiochus III briefly, but that, that was a brief process for in 198, the next year, Antiochus III defeats Scopus at the Battle of Panium, and it marks the end of the Ptolemaic rule in Judea. So now we have the north attacks the south, the south 
defends itself, the North attacks further, overcomes the South, and the South never regains that territory in Judea. But that boy king, he needed help ruling the nation. Is that where they called in Rome to come and help them? Exactly. Tell so us. Here's, here's what actually us. happened. Yeah. Now, in 200 BC, um, Roman emissaries came to Philip and Antiochus that were going to control and overcome Egypt. Now, Rome is very strong by now as a republic. Now, get this. Rome is ruling by what's called bread and circus. That's how they keep the masses docile and not thinking about the corruption in the government. Bread means welfare. Circus means entertainment. Oh, do we ever see that so today? So they press bread and circus, entertainment and welfare. So that you don't notice what's happening. So the you... public's not aware of the corruption in the government that's taking over according to their desire to amass wealth for themselves only oh, yes. at the expense of the country. And yes, whenever there's some major um, change made in the House or the Senate um, or some executive order passed, there seems to be some other thing to do with, it can be something to do with Hollywood or something right. to do with um, some entertainment or something, sports something else that keeps everybody occupied right. and then they can pull off whatever they want. Right. So what do we see now in this country? Circus is a, just as you said, entertainment. Movies, sports, music, the ways of the world, television, radio of the world, news of the world, which is nothing more than propaganda most of the time. So this is just ways of keeping the populace docile and asleep. And bread is welfare. Rome protected its grain supply from Egypt. Egypt provided grain to Rome in order to provide welfare grain to the populace to keep them fed and happy. And that put Rome in power, so whoever is providing this welfare um, becomes the power over that person that accepts it. Correct. So now Rome sees Egypt about to be attacked by the north. Combined forces from the north. So what is Rome going to do? <clears throat> Excuse me, it's going to protect its grain supply from Egypt. It sees Egypt being ruled by a very weak young boy, Ptolemy V. So, they then, Rome comes to the northern kings that are going to attack, and they tell both monarchs that were planning to invade Egypt to not. They both complied with Rome's demands. They knew full well that the Roman military was very strong, and they did not want to incur the attack of Rome against the north of Babylonia. So what happens now is Ptolemy V sees the north coming against Ptolemy, the, the south, and, uh, and wants a quick uh, conclusion to this process. So he signs a conciliatory treaty. This is Follow this carefully. Rome hasn't entered the picture yet fully with Ptolemy of the South. So Ptolemy signs a conciliatory treaty with Antiochus III in 195 BC, leaving the Seleucid king of the North in possession of Syria of the North, and then the South agrees to marry the daughter of Antiochus III, which is Cleopatra I. So Ptolemy V marries the, the daughter of Antiochus III of the North, as we saw already happen, to provide a treaty. As we saw already happen, meaning they're using marriage again. Marriage again. Now, then something critical happens. In verse 14, if you'd be so kind to read. Okay. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to be established, to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Exactly. So we see in those, in those times, now the, four, the Fifth Syrian War was from 202 to 195 B.C. Who were the robbers of the people? As we'll come to. That, that's significant here. So around 200 B.C., there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Now the ones that stood up against the king of the south, now the king of the south is the boy king, Ptolemy V. Of Egypt. Of Egypt. Who stood up against him were two rulers from the north. 
Um, one was Antiochus III of the Seleucid Northern Dynasty, and the other is the king of, Am of, of uh, Macedon, and uh, effectively from the north. They stand up against the king of the south, but now it brings in another agency, also the robbers of thy people. Now, that also translates as the breakers of thy people. Hmm. Now remember, this is the angel Gabriel giving Daniel information about what's going to come to pass later. So, the breakers of thy people turn out to be Rome, as we'll see. Who are thy people? Of the people of Daniel's nation. The people of, of Israel. following God. The people of the God's, true creator the true God of heaven. Exactly. Yes. So the robbers of that people, the one who break the people of Daniel, of Israel, we'll see how that comes about in the next verses. How do they exalt themselves? By their bid to control Greece. This was Rome's bid to control Greece. So in 200 BC, Rome first controls Greece by coming to the protection of Ptolemy V, the boy king, to protect their grain supply. So that, let me see. So Egypt says they have a boy king and they're worried about their grain supply. So they call on Rome to come and that gives Rome power over them. It does. Because they call on Rome to come and protect them. That's right. Yes. So Rome now is a tutor to the boy king, Ptolemy V. They offer their protection to Egypt. So Egypt effectively abnegates its sovereignty to Rome. That's right. Okay. So then we're going to find out pretty much the whole world's going to give their power to Rome. At the end of time, yes. Well, exactly here in this happen. story, is wasn't uh, then also Babylon turned their power over? As, How? We'll, as we'll soon see. Okay. So we see, so they, they shall exalt themselves in and control, and their bid to control Greece. So now the southern Ptolemaic dynasty abdicates sovereignty to Rome. They say to establish or confirm the vision, that's Daniel's vision of the fourth beast of Rome, as we'll see, but they shall fall. Now, that's a significant statement. Who is they? Rome. The so, robbers of that oh, people. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So we see that Rome would continue to the end of time, but it will fall into complete destruction at the second coming of Christ. This goes all the way to the end of time. So it shows us that Rome, in Daniel's vision, is the last nation against God's people that continues until the second coming of Christ. Yes, Rome is still in existence today, but why does it say, but they shall fall? The robbers of thy people, Rome, will fall at the end of time. Oh. It, it gives us a statement of hope okay. that this pervasive power of Rome that comes against Greece, that will come against God's people throughout history, will eventually come to its own end. Hmm. So, um, let's go further. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a great mount and shall take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Right. So this is the verse before the one I'm trying to get to that's important. This is the end of the fifth Syrian war. So well, the king of the north, Antiochus III, shall come in 198 BC against Egypt and its Aetolian forces under General Scopus. Now, causing Scopus' forces to retreat to the fenced city of Sidon. So now the south is protecting itself from the north, still, and it casts up a mount and takes the most fenced city. So Antiochus III successfully besieges Scopus and his army, and the arms of the south of the Ptolemaic dynasty shall not withstand, neither Ptolemy V's chosen people, that is Scopus and the Aetolian army. Now there shall be any strength to withstand. So Scopus and his army are defeated and are given only terms of life at the end of the war. That ends that fifth Syrian war. But it's leading to something significant here. That's what I want to come to now. So we see that the north attacks the south successfully. The Ro Rome is intervening to protect its grain supply. But the, it, the Aetolian army under Scopus that is protecting the south is ineffective against Rome, uh, Antiochus the bid to, con to control Egypt. But Rome is still with Egypt, so Antiochus III does not attack deep into Egypt. They agreed not to do that. Otherwise, they'd incur the response from Rome. Now we're going to see what happens in verse 16 in the Syrian War. 
But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will. That means no one resists him by what we're learning. <clears throat> and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. Good. Now these are two segments of history that are separated by um, over a century. So let's describe these clearly. But he now refers to Rome, the robbers of thy people. Rome is now clearly on the prophetic scene. But he, Rome, that comes against him, that is the king of the north. Now at this time, the king of the north is the brother of Antiochus III. It's now Antiochus IV in the Sixth Syrian War. And Rome does according to his own will. That is, Rome continues to grow in power and success successfully destroys any opposing power. We're going to see how. And then shall stand before him. So here's what actually happens. Antiochus IV, in 168, is given an ultimatum. Here's what actually happens. They met, he met with the king of the... Antiochus IV is now attacking Egypt, and he's gaining the upper hand over Egypt. So now, what happens is Rome intervenes. And here's how. The, uh, as Egypt is being attacked, they ask Rome to intervene specifically, and here's what happens. In 168 BC, the Egyptians send to Rome to ask for their help, and the Roman Senate dispatches a legate by the name of Gaius Popilius Lanus. Now, this regent knows Alexander IV. They met before on friendly terms. But now, um, Gaius Papilius Lanus is sent to Alexandria to meet with Antiochus IV of the north. So now remember, Rome is protecting its interests in the south. But here's what actually happens. Papilius offers the king of the north, Antiochus IV, an ultimatum from the Senate of Rome. Either evacuate Egypt and Cyprus immediately, or he'll have to draw the attack of Rome. So get this. Antiochus IV says, I need time. Papilius says, no problem. He draws in the sand with his cane a circle all the way around Antiochus IV, king of the north. He says, take all the time you need. But the moment you leave the circle, you have to give me your decision. Or else. <laughs> yeah. So it didn't take much thought on the part of Antiochus IV. He yielded to Rome, chose to obey the Roman ultimatum, and abdicate Grecian authority to Rome and not attack Egypt. Now the north, under Antiochus IV, abdicates its sovereignty to Rome by agreeing with Rome's ultimatum to not attack the south. So now Rome has full control over both the north and the south. The, to the Seleucid dynasty of the north, Ptolemaic dynasty of the south. Because he told him, if you step out of the circle without giving me a decision what you're going to do, you're a goner. Right. And so he told him right at that moment, okay, I'll let Rome have rule over my nation. Yes. By abnegating sovereignty. Now here's what happens. So the north, northern king Antiochus IV, counterattacks successfully, but he's given an ultimatum by, by Rome, an ultimatum, to not attack Egypt. This is in 168. He relinquishes and abnegates his sovereignty to Rome. The south, under Ptolemy VI, attacks, but he's resisted. So his brother engages Rome to come to their assistance, and that's the one that then the legate from the Senate tells the northern king, not to attack. Hmm. So it's a stalemate. The north and south are stalemated by Rome. Rome now effectively becomes the new king of the north. That's the key here. Ah, so all of this fighting, mm -hmm. until everyone is so exhausted, they can't make any progress and it's just deteriorating the, their own nations and their resources and their armies. Right. And they finally both decide that it's best to just give your sovereignty over to Rome, and now Rome becomes the king right. of the north. Exactly. And that's what those six Syrian wars have led up to. Do you think today that um, there'll be so much fighting when 
Jesus said that kingdom nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there'll be wars and famine and pestilence. If things got bad enough that this nation would turn its sovereignty over to someone else? That's what's being set up. In history we see the pattern. Sovereignty was yielded to Rome. In our day we will see the same thing. Rome became the king of the north, de facto king of the north, by 168 BC. Mm -hmm when both the North and South dynasties of Greece mm -hmm. yielded sovereignty to Rome. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens in the last part of verse 16 to, to demonstrate that. Fast forward, there are two more King of the North, King of the South conflicts to still unpack in the rest of Daniel 11, Oof. starting in verse 23. But we're going to finish this section out first. And we'll see at the end of time, in our day, Again, there's an abdication of sovereignty of this country to Rome. And we find that in, in the book of Revelation. When you put this template over Revelation exactly. and start looking at some of the same events and principles, you'll see how that comes right. about in this nation. Precisely. So here we see this progression to Rome becoming the de facto new king of the north. That's how that transition occurred. Now let's go back to verse 16. I'll read the second part of 16. It says, okay. And men shall stand before him. This is when abnegation of sovereignty is given to Rome in 168 BC. And he, Rome, at the time of Pompey now. Now Pompey is a general in 63 BC of Rome. He shall stand or rule in the glorious land. Now the glorious land is where God's glory is manifest in his people. So in Judea, in ancient Israel, God's people, his chosen to proclaim the first coming of the Messiah, of Christ, were chosen to give that message to the world. And this is why Rome was in rule over the Jews when Jesus came and was born and while Jesus was on the earth. Yes. And the Jews hated the Romans and yet they were under the Roman yoke. And that's right there is where that shows that that was the case. That's exactly right. How many years before Christ was that? This is in 63 B.C. So Christ's ministry begins in 27 AD. I see. So this is 80 years prior to that. Mm -hmm. So we see this event taking place um, in verse 16, the second half. Mm -hmm. So Rome under Pompey stands in the glorious land of Judea, right. which by his hand shall be consumed. So in 63 BC, Pompey demolishes Jerusalem because he was quelling a revolt that was going on between two Maccabean brothers. I'll leave the history out. But Rome comes in and makes Judea a, a state that owes now its sovereignty to Rome and now must pay Rome its ah taxes. Its taxes. So that's where the Jews resented it even more because they didn't exactly. want. And that paying of the taxes is why Jesus was required, Joseph and Mary were required to go to Bethlehem where Jesus was born because that was their hometown. Exactly. And it was the Roman yoke that was to saying to them, uh, you have to go to your hometown. And also, where does it fit in that the Republic of Rome fell before Jesus came? It was an empire and Rome was an empire with, uh, they're the ones that coined the phrase, by the people, for the people, yes. and um, then the yoke of Rome was over them. When did that Republic of Freedom fall, where they had a house and a senate? So I'll explain. Yeah. We see that in the next verse. Okay. Hmm. All right. So the next verse of verse 17 leads to the collapse of the Roman Republic. Okay. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her. But, shall, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. All right. Now this begins the development of the collapse of the Roman Republic. Hmm. The Roman Republic was formed in 509 BC. It ends in 27 BC. This is 48 BC hmm. under Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar rises to power, he begin, that commences the end of the Roman Republic, as we'll see. So Julius Caesar defeats Pompey in battle. Pompey was another general 
of Rome. Now you have an internal strife, like a civil war. And well, so the it, the republic turned into an empire after a civil war. Yes, it does. Interesting. Now Pompey is murdered in Egypt by one of the Ptolemaic kings. Now Julius Caesar enters his face to enter Egypt. So Egypt is in revolt against Rome. Pompey was sent in order to quell the revolt of Egypt. He's killed. Julius Caesar feels it's his right to do that because the previous king of Egypt asked Rome to intervene. So he sets his face to Egypt, the strength of his whole kingdom. Now Rome and its allies, all the neighboring countries, come to Julius Caesar's aid to quell this Egyptian uprising in what's called the Siege of Alexandria in 47 BC. And upright ones with him. Now the upright ones translate also as righteous ones. So the Jews went with them? Yes. Hmm. So Antipater, the Idumean, a descendant from Edom, joins Julius Caesar with 3,000 Jews. And he holds the passes into Egypt, permitting supporting armies from Syria to come and assist Julius Caesar in quelling the riot and the revolts in Alexandria in Egypt. So the Jews went to battle with Rome. Yes. At that point they had. Mm -hmm. Now Rome had now successfully entered into and absorbed the whole of the original Greek Empire under mm -hmm. Alexander the Great. What would be the glorious land today? I know that the glorious land uh, in being Israel is not the case any longer because it always stands for the the group of people that represent Jesus. Amen. And the, this country was ordained by God um, to have religious freedom, religious liberty, and to, for the most part, be a Christian nation is how it began. That's why they put on the money and God we trust. On all of our money, we see that written. And this nation was blessed by God to... Um, one nation under God right. with liberty and justice for Amen. all. So and you, so would this nation be the glorious land in uh, the book of Revelation? We can show that definitely that would be a case. What would you say about that? Well, we see it in verse 41 of uh, Daniel 11, okay. which we'll be coming to. But the glorious land, again, is where God's glory is manifest through his church, through his people. Where it was designed to be. Amen. They can turn their back on him, but that would be the land that God... Right had committed his grace to shine upon. Exactly. So we see the glory was in Judea initially as his chosen people were to give the message of the first advent of Christ. The Lord has a second advent movement at the end of time to proclaim Christ's second coming, which is focused mainly in this country, which becomes a glorious land at the end of time. So I'd like to finish with verse 17 now, with the collapse of the Roman Republic. Okay. So um, it, con it continues. So an upright one's with him. We saw how the Jews allowed Julius Caesar to be, prevail in Egypt. And thus he, Julius Caesar, do, thus shall Julius Caesar do. And he, that is Pompey, whose death provided Julius Caesar the opportunity to influence the fate of Egypt by intervening between two rival um, children of the Ptolemaic dynasty okay. shall give him Julius Caesar, the daughter of women. Now, Cleopatra the seventh was one of the two that was rival, two rivals for control of Egypt. She and her brother. The brother was um, Ptolemy the thirteenth, and Cleopatra the seventh is her sister, his sister. Mm. Their father wanted them to co-rule, to marry each other and co-rule. But Cleopatra the Seventh saw that she was going to lose ground to Julius Caesar, who's going mm -hmm. to weigh in favor of her brother. So she decides, so she is called and she, the daughter of women. So Cleopatra the Seventh becomes Caesar's cohort How? by deception. What she does is she has her very strong eunuch um, servant wrap her up in. Uh, Carpet. Blankets. Carpets. It was a rug, I thought. And, a rug, and, and carries her on his shoulder to yeah. deliver to Julius Caesar. 
So he's successful delivering this package. Be beautiful carpet. <laughs> to Julius Caesar, lays it on the ground and leaves. Caesar notices it wiggles. He unwraps it, and she's there in all her womanly glory and wiles, and seduces him and becomes his consort, and thereby wins his favor to maintain her position of power and life in Rome, in, in Egypt. In Egypt. At that time, in Egypt, yeah. from Rome. So, but he corrupts her. That's what it says at the end. So Julius Caesar and he, Julie, and, and she, Cleopatra the Seventh, spend time in utter debauchery, and she has a child by him. But she, Cleopatra the Seventh, shall not stand on his side. That what verse is, are you in now? 17. Okay. Continue in 17. So Cleopatra the Seventh was not to continue in relationship with Julius Caesar. He was to be assassinated in Rome, but not to be for him. So Julius Caesar and his country, Rome, instead Cleopatra the Seventh joins herself with Mark Antony. Oh, she after, just took whatever could protect her and give her yes, power. Yes, yes. So after Julius Caesar's death, Mark Antony emerges as one of the leaders of Rome, so she unites with him and attempts to take over rule of Rome unsuccessfully. When she and Mark Antony are defeated at the Battle of Actium, by Octavian Caesar in 31 BC. Mm. So let's go further. In um, verse 18. So verse 18 um, is leading us to the very end of the Roman Republic. We'll pick this up from what we'll, where we, we'll leave off here today and pick this up with our next lecture. Where Rome turns into an empire. Precisely. Ruled by a Caesar, by, ruled by a dictator in a sense. Exactly. Mm -hmm. By an emperor. An emperor. Yeah. So we'll watch that transition occur here. Um, in verse 18 and 19. Right. By verse 20, we will have an empire in Rome. Yeah, and that's real important to understand how that happened because this nation will follow suit. It will. It will follow it's, the it's same path. It's on the pattern. same path as, as we'll see has happened in the Republic of Rome. Yes. The way the Roman Republic ended is exactly what's happening in the American Republic today. So let's end with a moment of prayer. Would you be so kind to lead out? Father in heaven, these great... Mm -hmm. Uh, in horrific battles that were fought. They're dark and they're heavy, and um, it's hard for us to look at these things. Show us uh, the history that we can warn the people and understand what's coming upon this earth. We ask that you give us your spirit and let us see Jesus, the Prince of Peace, that gives us the peace that passes understanding to keep our hearts and minds. We ask that we will hide ourselves in you, Lord, right now we choose to have you as our king, our protector, our shepherd to lead us. And we thank you for the salvation that you have given us in dying on the cross for us. We ask, Lord, that you would let our lives reflect you in all ways. Come into us through your spirit and live your life out through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.